Welcome to Success Theory, and in this episode, we're going to discuss thinking systematically. We're actually going to discuss six very clear steps in a process to help you think through issues in a systematic way. Now, this video will be leaned more towards or leaning more towards how a manager, a coach, or a team member would work through an issue within a corporate environment, within a work environment, within a team environment. But if you hold on to the end of the video, I am going to discuss how you can use this idea and these steps within your own life to sort through habits or problems that you might be having that you need to have a process for. But we'll discuss that at the end, but let's get right into it. If you are a coach or a leader or somebody who works within an organization and on the operations side or just generally working within a team, you will find these six steps extremely helpful. And the first step is actually fairly obvious because first thing you have to do is actually identify the issue, which some people might think, well, that's simple, but there is more to it than meets the eye. But let's discuss that further. The first step to solving any issue is to look deeper into it. Map out that process, get deep into it, use a whiteboard, use post-it notes, use whatever kind of system, online, offline, whatever it is to help you see the A to Z, A to Z off that system. Now, this is where you might get some surprises. This is where there could be more to it than meets the eye. You might think the problem is between B and D, but the actual problem might be between X and Y. And the only way that you were able to map that out or the only way you were able to discover that is because you mapped it out. A lot of people and a lot of organizations, and I don't know if you've ever worked somewhere like this before, lots of problems get fixed by knee-jerk reactions. And the main systemic issue never really goes away because people keep plastering over the cracks, but the actual real issue never gets fixed. And that's why you need to get deep into it and you actually need to find the root cause of the problem. And that's why you need to map the system. And this first part moves very easily into the second part where you actually have to track the issue over time. Let's discuss it. One of the key mistakes a lot of people make when they're trying to fix issues within an organization or within a team or even within your life is that they base their data or they base their actions on the current situation. They base it on that day, that week, that month. All problems or all serious problems, all complex problems should be tracked across a time curve. They should be tracked over weeks, months, even years. You should be able to use data to go back. And if you work within an organization, you should be able to pull out some type of sales data reporting that can support you in investigating what the actual issue is. But you need to track it over time because if you're only ever making decisions based on the data that you have in that day or that week, you're gonna be making a lot of decisions that aren't quite, quite right. So you need to have that time curve, you need to have the issue tracked. Before you make any big decisions, you've gotta have the data, it's gotta be tracked, and that's how you make really key, important decisions. If you're in a meeting and you're looking at data in the next couple of weeks and your manager or your ops manager, your director, the CEO, the entrepreneur running the business wants to make a snap decision because of something that happened yesterday, tell them to slow down, get the data out, dig deep into it, go back months, years, and actually track the issue so you make better, stronger, and more effective decisions that can actually save you a lot of time and a lot more money than this knee-jerk reaction stuff that all of us are way too used to seeing within many of the organizations that we work. Then we move on to step three. Creating a change statement is one of the most important parts of this process. It again is another part that many organizations, many corporate environments, even CEOs, entrepreneurs, they forget about this. There are large organizations that I've worked within over the years where change will come down the pipeline and the people on, on the shop floor, your, your Jennies and your Johns, they'll be told you'll no, you're no longer doing process A, B, C, D. You're now doing process X, Y, Z. And they'll, they'll push back and be like, well, why? And their managers weren't told why. And they'll just say, well, that's just the way we're doing it now, John and Jenny. Just get it done. And the morale in those environments hits rock bottom. People don't want to do it. They get upset. They're changing their, their processes. And it can all be avoided if you actually give the staff the why. Not only define the change, what the change is gonna be, define the why, why it's happening, 
why it has to be changed, and then also the how, what, when, where, why of how the process is going to be done. The worst thing you can do, and the thing that happens the most, is people make decisions, they tell the staff to change, but they don't give them the why, they don't give them the purpose behind it, and these people live your process. They are the process. You're the process probably in your team. You've probably experienced this. A change has come down the pipeline from the managers, from the CEOs, from the upper tiers of the organization. And that why and that how is just left in the ether. It's very ambiguous. And you've got to kind of figure it out yourself. And you go through change. Your team doesn't like it. You don't like it. And you kind of feel a bit disillusioned with the organization. Sound about right? Yeah, it happens quite a lot. Trust me. I've gone through it a lot, a lot of us have. And you can avoid this by creating a very, very simple defined change statement with very, very simple why it's happening and a very, very simple process of the how, what, when, where, why the staff need to do it. It's simple. Why don't we do it? I don't know, but it's simple. You should do it, do it, just, just do it, please do it, just do it. No, you do it, no, 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 you do it first. No, please, just do it. That now leads us very smoothly into Stage five. Stage five is really the observation stage. This part of the process, part five of the process, is when you really look at the first four parts and you observe what's happened, how the change is happening, you've created the change statement, you've implemented the change in, in stage four and process part four, and your staff are now doing it, the change is happening, and you observe how is it going, what's going on, you're getting the feedback, is the change happening, does extra coaching need, need to happen? Uh, do they understand the process? Do they know why it's happening? How easy is it? Are we fixing the problem that we identified? Are we on the right track? Are we trending towards this problem being overcome? And that's what stage five is all about. And this is where your process might finish. You might actually get to this part and everything that you did up to stage five might be great. The problem might be going away, your revenue might be back up, your shrinkage might be down. Whatever that problem is, it might be slowly but surely going away or you might have eradicated it completely. And that's great. That means you did a great job. That means we, the process worked well. You identified the issues. You went deep into it. You came up with a new process. You sold it to your staff. You told them their why. They went out onto the shop floor, into the world, and, and speaking with their customers, dealing with their, their processes, whatever that may be, whatever industry you're working in, and they were able to defeat that problem. However, how often does that happen? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it happens. But usually, and I've experienced this, usually it doesn't work. Usually more is needed, extra is needed. We need to take things to a deeper level. And this is where we step into stage six or part six of the process. Part six is pretty straightforward. It's plan B or the intervention stage. I have observed this happening a couple of times in my career where it's gone really well right at the start of a project right at the start of a cycle happening a secondary plan is built if we don't hit a certain target by a certain date or if we are not able to turn this around by a certain time we need to go down path b we need to take further action there may be a new team of hire uh, of hires need to come in a, a support team there might have to be uh, some changes made elsewhere that uh, affect the, the bottom line, all these different ideas, uh, you know, another department might need to help, whatever that is, that might have been part of your original plan, but what I'm talking about here is these extra blocks that you didn't want to use on your first pass, but you've got them in reserve, you've told your your, your teams, your operations, your directors, your, your executives, your C-suite people, they know that in reserve you have these building blocks these extra coins to spend if things don't go right. Now, when I say that, I've also been in situations where I've worked with organizations where that isn't even on the table. They haven't got a plan B, they haven't got an intervention, and that's just stupid. Anytime that you're creating a massive change in an organization, as a project manager, as a leader, as a coach, even if you're doing it with yourself, even if you're doing it with other people, you've gotta have a plan B. You've gotta have a secondary system in place that if things don't go right, that you have a plan and you're not scrambling when things go wrong to be like, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we know what we're doing. We've already planned for it. We're gonna use these assets uh, that we put to the side at the start six months ago and we're gonna bring them onto the board. We're gonna put them into play. We're gonna 
shift things around a little bit. We're going to bring a department from the East Coast and they're going to support the West Coast and we're going to see whether that helps fix the problem. Always have a plan B and that is stage six or part six of the process. Make sure that you underwrite every change that you do or every problem that you're trying to solve, you underwrite it with an emergency backup plan that will allow you to get the results that you need if your original plans don't work. I did say at the start of the video that I would discuss how you can use these six stages or this process in your own life. And you can. It's very simple. If you're trying to make a big change in your life, this process will help you. Now, this process is more for complex changes, big changes. Not simple, small changes like you want to get up half an hour earlier. It doesn't really need that in-depth, deep dive. These are like processes that you need for big changes. Like you want to lose 50 pounds in weight. You want to gain 20 pounds in weight. You you, you want to get out of two or three thousand dollars worth of debt. You want to make some money. You want to start a business. Whatever it is, this problem solving process can work for you in your own life. Because you, first of all, identify the issues. Pretty straightforward. Everybody should be doing that if they have issues in your life. Second of all, you want to know why the issues happen. What, where are you self-sabotaging yourself? What are you doing that makes you eat too much food or, or not work out enough or spend too much money? Then you need, want to make a change statement. You want to write out what exactly you're going to change in your life, why you're going to change it, and the how, what, when, and where the changes are going to uh, be taken in your life. Then you want to observe. You want to make sure changes are, are happening. You want to review the process. You want to make sure that you're actually getting the results you want and then have that plan B. Have that plan B, that underwriting, that uh, underwritten, sorry, that, that intervention, that if you don't, don't get out of two grand of debt or you don't lose the weight or you're not able to do the, the, the changes that you want to do, that you have that extra idea of like, no, I'm going to cut up my credit cards or whatever the, the plan B it was. I'm going to go to a special retreat to be able to help me with whatever issues you have. You have this plan B in, in place, this, these extra assets, this extra idea that you can move on to the board if your first ideas did not work. This really works. It's worked for me having these kind of structures in my life and it's something that will definitely work for you. So not only can you take these six systematic steps and use them as a project manager, as a leader, as a coach, you can also use them in your own life to make you a better person. Thanks very much for watching through to this part of the video. I really do appreciate it. If you could hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, that would be super awesome. I also have links below to my website, to my coaching services, and to my products. You should check them out at yoursuccessseries.com. Links below the video. Thanks very much. Make it a good one.